All right, welcome back to CS50. This is the end of week seven. So, as a follow up to our brief discussion on electronic voting machines on Monday, I thought I'd show you this excerpt, if you didn't catch it Sunday night, from The Simpsons Treehouse of Horror 19, which、uh, with Homer here was rather on point. I'd like to vote for president, governor, and anything that will take money away from our parks and libraries.、Uh, use machine number three. <laughs>、oh, I can't fit in the booth. Use the double wide. Ooh, one of those electronic voting dealies. One vote for McCain. Thank you. <laughs> no, I want to vote for Obama. Two votes for McCain.、Mm, come on, it's time for a change. Three votes for McCain. No, no, no. Six votes for President McCain. Hey, I only met one of those votes for McCain. <gasps> This machine is rigged. <laughs> Must tell. President McCain. This doesn't happen in America. Maybe Ohio, but not in America. So a bit of a non sequitur now. Hash tables. So we started talking on Monday about more sophisticated data structures than those in past weeks. We had arrays initially. Last week we had linked lists, but our goal on Monday was to begin to chip away at the running time of these algorithms and give ourselves a bit more flexibility. For instance, when it comes to linked lists, what have we said is the asymptotic、uh, running time of, say, the find operation, assuming the linked list is storing a bunch of alphabetized names or numbers. What's the running time, Big Go? Is that a hand or a? If you grip the wood there, that's your hand going up. What's the asymptotic running time, would you say, of search in a linked list? What's that? A big O of n saved by over here. So yeah, so big O of n because the problem with a linked list is that you sacrifice random access. You sacrifice the ability to jump to some arbitrary location by way of a pointer or by way,、uh, more、uh, conveniently, of the bracketed notation, the index value of some array. But we gain something from linked lists. What was one of the pluses of going to linked lists from arrays? You can、uh, a little louder. So you can insert and delete easily in the sense that you don't have to, for instance, reallocate a whole bunch of memory if you need to cram one additional element in there. You can just make room for it by allocating only enough memory for that new element. And as we saw through some of those pictures and by walking through code, you can kind of insert elements anywhere you want in a linked list. And by contrast, with an array, you had to do a lot more work because you had to shift everything over to the left or to the right to make room for that thing. And when we did that. Example up here with a byte's worth of students, and we actually were doing selection sort and insertion sort. Well, one of the gotchas there. Was even though it was very easy verbally to say, "Okay, you go here." The problem was there was this trickle-down effect on everyone else because they all had to go one step to the left. And in code, each of those steps, even though humans can do them all at once, require of you as many as n different steps just to insert someone. And so, in theory, we're beginning to chip away at some of those problems with linked lists. But as n grows large, linked lists—they're still pretty linear, and you give up tools like binary search again because you don't have random access. So finally. Toward the tail end of Monday, we introduced this notion of a, a hash table, and sort of the carrot in front of us on Monday was to actually achieve constant time operations for things like insert, for things like search, and it almost sounds too good to be true, at least to a computer scientist. And it is. It's a bit of a white lie to say that insert and find in these things is just constant time, because we had these things known as collisions. So we talked briefly about the birthday problem, and we claimed by way of some mathematics, you know what? Collisions, even if you just have random data coming in, random numbers, random names being inserted to your data structure, it's pretty darn likely. And so that begged the question: How do you deal with these collisions? And so we looked at coalesce chaining. 
or rather we looked at first linear probing, whereby you try to find a location for that element and if there's something already there, for instance if you hit a collision right there in location one like we did the other day, well then you simply look for the next available location by checking here, checking here, checking here and you probe linearly until you find an open spot. But a downside of that was that there was no sort of remembrance of where you had tried to hash to. So hash was sort of the key word on Monday, using it on the context of a hash function or to hash like a verb. So if we hash to the location one and found that there was something there, in linear probing we keep checking, checking, checking for the first available spot and finally when we find an opening, if we do, we plop that element there. But we followed that up with a quick mention of coalesce chaining. And this was sort of a baby step toward a more common implementation, which is where we'll focus today. And coalesce chaining, as this picture suggests, is that in addition to the names that you're inserting or the ID numbers, whatever it is, you keep around some additional metadata, maybe a pointer, maybe just an int, which is the index location that you finally found the spot for. So you would still, for instance, probe linearly, or at least using some kind of heuristics, but as soon as you find the destination where there's room for this new person's name, or this new ID number, well you just make a notation as up here in where you tried to go so that you draw effectively an arrow to where you ended up. So you put in other words in that piece of memory the pointer at which you ended up or the index location at which you ended up, breadcrumbs so to speak, so that you can find that spot more quickly. Now in real, in uh, theoretical terms this is all still very linear, right? Because in the worst case you might have to probe sort of all day long until you hit the end of the list and so there's still not necessarily a perfect solution here. But now as we begin to solve real problems, as in the case of problem set six, implementing a spell checker, well actually accepting that, you know what, we're not always going to see the worst case is kind of a reassurance that we don't necessarily have to make the theoretically optimal decisions. We just have to make decisions now that work pretty well in the real world. So that too is a trade-off. So we finally settled on separate chaining, which is just a um, fancy way of describing a data structure like this. And it's oriented a little differently from the way we drew it on the board. But the idea is that any hash table typically implemented, at least in this fashion, is really just a big array. And the array might be of size 13, just because that's a prime number and that tends to be useful mathematically. Or it might be something in the millions if you have a ridiculous amount of data that you need to store, but it's a fixed size array. But what is stored at each of those locations in the array is no longer the person's ID number, is no longer the student's name, but instead just a pointer. So your hash table is really just a really big array, or an array of some size, of pointers. But pointers to what? So linked lists, essentially. And we looked last week at an implementation of linked lists and it was really all about pointers. Now how did we implement a linked list? Well, we used a struct. So we called that struct, I think, last week a node. And what did a node have inside of it? What did a node have inside of it? This was in, uh, say, list1.h. So a node was this thing, and it's very simple. Last time it had an, uh, an integer n, so the ID number or whatever it was, and then a piece of metadata, which in this case was just a pointer. And so that's precisely what a picture like this is hinting at. Even though this one focuses on names, the idea is the same. Each of the structures that are being stored in this hash table, they look a bit like these rectangles here. It looks like one field is of what data type? What's the first field in each of these nodes in this hash table? Yeah, so like a char star or an array of characters because we actually have a person's name and then probably this little square at the end of it, it's a 32-bit pointer, which in this case is null, which is just meant to point to the next such element to the right-hand side. So let's just go back then, at least mentally, to what we did last week. If we instead wanted to modify this linked list, which this really is, this is an array of linked lists, so chains so to speak, because they can be of different lengths, well, what do we have to do to modify this structure if we want to start storing, say, students' names in this thing instead of just ints? Well, what needs to be changed about this node structure? Yeah, we don't really need that anymore. We just need a char star and call it name or call it s or whatever the case might be. Now, how much memory does a node structure take up per this definition? How many bytes or how many bits? Okay, eight bytes. Anyone want to propose more? Okay, good. 
Because you'd be wrong. So, eight bytes, but why is that? Well, it's just two pointers, right? The first one is the, a pointer to a char. Now, unfortunately, you can't actually cram the name into that pointer, so we're going to have to do a bit more trickery to actually store that. But these are just two pointers, which means that even though we're depicting now what is this linked list structure, which again has these rectangular structs, really it'd probably be more accurate to draw them as shorter rectangles where the name field is just as big as the pointer field, because after all, they are just pointers. But we could be a little more consistent. If I really wanted to accept the fact that, you know what, I don't want to just store a pointer in here, I want to store the actual name, well, what is an alternative design that might very well be reasonable, albeit with some trade offs? Instead of storing a char star, I could store, yeah, so I heard an array. And what's the longest name we're going to see? I mean, we can be really conservative and say, no one's really going to have a name longer than 128 characters. And if you really want to be paranoid, you could say 1024. And then if there's someone with a ridiculously long name, sort of a Simpsons like character, well, then you just truncate their name. It just won't fit in the data structure. And that might very well be an acceptable trade-off. So now this picture might look a little more like this one because you have a long structure on the left and just a little pointer at the end. But what is a downside of this approach to implementing each of these nodes here? Yeah. Oh, you're doing it again. <laughs> All right, we'll let you off the hook this time. What's a downside of this definition? What's a downside of doing things this way? What do you got? You're wasting a lot of space, right? And most people don't have names that require 1,024 characters. So we're certainly overcommitting, but we're wasting all of that space. And if the database isn't that big, fine. Maybe not such a big deal because it makes the implementation pretty easy. Because if I instead go this route of using a char star, what's the implication? What do I need to do in my code somewhere now to deal with this design decision? Yeah, you're going to have to malloc things, which is fine, especially if you're careful and you're not traversing null pointers and you're not forgetting to free your memory. But it is an additional step. So more development time versus quicker development time, but more space use. So again, these are the kinds of design decisions that will really come out in problem set six when we're given, you're given a very large data set, an English dictionary of like 100,000 plus words, and then the bytes begin to add up if you make foolish or at least simplistic decisions. But we can do even more sophisticated designs than lists. So we didn't walk through this last week, but I'll at least I'll draw your attention to it in case it's a useful reference for problem set six. Notice that we don't have to cram everything into just one structure. So this is list2.h from last week, and we have two structs defined here. One's a student and one's a node. So in the previous example, in last week, I kind of didn't make a distinction between the objects in my linked list and the actual data I was trying to store. In other words, I commingled the data with the metadata just because it got the job done and it was simple. But if you're trying to store more than just a name, for instance, you also want to store someone's ID and you might also want to store, say, their house in a Harvard sense and so forth, the more and more data you want to store, it becomes a little strange to keep calling this thing a node right cuz this is really now becoming a student but students don't have next pointers inherently associated with them so you get this sort of weird design implications right it's not necessarily that you shouldn't or couldn't do this but again this sort of should start rubbing the the design sense in you the wrong way cuz you're kind of blurring the distinction between metadata and data so here's an approach that kind of factors that idea out so we now go ahead and say you know what i know what a student is and i know what i want to associate with a student and very simply it's this struct so in the top here i've just defined a student to be a um, have an id have a name and have a house now a little c trivia why have i not mentioned the word student here as I've mentioned the word node here. It's not a typo. I don't know. Okay. Actually, that only made sense to me and the fellow in the back who just did this. So why did I not bother including the word student here? Yeah. I'm having fun today, so it's all right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So we only need something here if we're actually going to reference that temporary name, so to speak, elsewhere within the structure. So we needed it here because we needed to have this sort of referential thing going on inside of the structure. But we don't actually, it's not actually required in type defing a struct. It suffices to do things this way. All right. So notice now what I've done. So here's a student structure. And I can declare those things just by saying student s. 
semicolon or student t semicolon, and that will give me a variable of type student. But if I now want to start plopping these students into a linked list, it kind of is a little cleaner to define my linked list as independent of. The actual piece of data being stored. And so, what I can do is define the linked list structure, so this so called node, but store in it just a pointer. So, just like we were storing a char star to store a name, it's kind of the same idea, but we're storing a little more than a name now. We're storing an actual structure, an ID, a name, and a house. So, now what's going to be in my linked list are things that look like the thing in the bottom there, these nodes called, these structs called nodes. And there's now at least kind of a line in the sand between what's my real data that I care about. And what's just kind of helper code that I'm writing in order to get a job like this or something simpler like a linked list done? So, there are a few implications for syntax. And in tackling problem set six this weekend and next week, note that in list2.c is a very similar implementation to what we did last week with numbers. So, if I go ahead and run、uh, list2, You'll see a little demo program like this where you can insert something. And now it asks me for the student's ID, it asks me for the student's name, it asks me for the student's house, and now it shows me the list. So it's the same program, but more than storing numbers, it's storing more pieces of information and stringing them together in a nice phrase like David of Mather, parenthetically, his ID number. So let me go ahead and quit and just point out the syntax and why this might be a useful thing to keep in mind. So let's go ahead to the traverse function. Which is probably the simplest to look at and the least redundant from last week. So here it is. It's pretty short, but notice the use of arrow notation. So the traverse function again just starts at the left of your list, dot, 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 and walks along the whole list until it hits null. So we have this temporary pointer here called PTR, initialized to first. And what was first, to be clear? Same approach from last week. What was first? Is it a local variable? You can kind of answer that even if you're not quite sure what's going on, right? It's not, because it's not declared within the most recent curly braces. So, in fact, it was declared way up here as my linked list. So, that's kind of a bold claim. It seems that to implement a linked list, all you need to do is declare a pointer to a node. And in fact, that's all you need, right? It was just that 32 bits that keeps track of the start of the list because of the chains we're able to reach everything else. So, assuming we initialize PTR to that thing, all I'm going to do in order to print all these things out is the following. While this pointer is not null, which I'm going to constantly update as I walk the list, print out a string, the word of, a string, and then a number in parentheses. What am I printing? Well, I'm going to print whatever the current pointer is, pointing at students. Well, what was student? Well, again, take a quick look at list2.h, which is this thing. Student was just the name of the pointer inside a node that actually contains something interesting, or more properly, points to something interesting. So this is a pointer, student, just as pointer is a student. So what I'm really doing here is starting at one pointer. Following the arrow to the student object being pointed at. And then from there, because it's a pointer, diving into that struct and going to get the field called name. And to be clear, why did I not do this? Which is very related syntax. Why did I not do that? Yeah, so student, quite simply, is a pointer. It's not the variable that is of type student, it's of type student,、uh, student star. Per the definition in that file a moment ago. And so the arrow notation is what we need to do.、Okay? So I'll leave you with this in mind, since when it comes to implementing problem set six, you're actually going to have a lot of design discretion. You have to implement a spell checker. That's going to reduce to implementing a really fast dictionary, where we, by dictionary here, we mean some kind of data structure or set of data structures that support some common operations, like lookup. Like load, load the thing from disk into memory, unload, actually free up whatever memory you've allocated. And that's it. And what we'll provide you with come Friday is a framework with which to benchmark your code, whereby we will call those functions that you write hundreds of thousands of times to spell check really large files, including like the King James、uh, the Fifth Bible,、um, a, uh, I think some Simpsons quotes, just to sort of show the other extreme, and then several documents that are somewhere in between. The types of data structures you'll be able to draw on are really up to you. So, Implementing your dictionary in one huge long linked list for a hundred, of length 
probably not ideal because whatever you look up is going to take you know, n over 2 on average operations to actually find it because it might be at the front, it might be at the end, and you can't do binary search. More common is to implement, and probably wiser is to implement, something like a hash table. And to be clear, a hash table is just a big array, each of whose elements is going to be a linked list. But you do have to come up with an interesting, some answers to some interesting questions. One, how big should the array be? Right? Size 10, such that you get really long chains. Size、um, a million, so that you really get no chains or chains of size 1. There are going to be trade offs here in terms of time and space. But what about that thing called a hash function? So, what was the hash function we talked about on Monday? What did we do in order to plop someone into the linked list that we had on, or the hash table that we had on the board? Sorry? Yeah, so we just used modulo. So, in, verbally, we just said, all right, take the ID number mod 6, I think was the size of that array on Monday. Well, if we wanted to implement this thing as a function in C, we probably want to do something like this implement a function called hash. It's going to take, in that case, an ID number. And the purpose of this hash function, the terminology being consistent with the goal here of returning a value, is just going to be to return ID mod 6. And if I really wanted to be a little wiser, I could do this as a constant and then define this thing as a constant up here and so forth, but some very basic C ideas. Now, that might be fine for ID numbers. What might we want to do if we now need to hash on people's names? So now the hash function isn't going to take ID numbers, but it's going to take a string S. What are our options? And to be clear, the goal of returning an int, what should this hash function be returning? The number of what? What does the int being returned represent? So, yeah, the index into the array that we were going to be plopping this. So, in other words, this function's purpose in life is to tell you where to plop this person's name or where to put that person's ID. Unfortunately, it's not as simple as just plopping it there. If it tells you to go here, you don't actually put it here. What you're going to do, if you follow the implications of this picture, is instead allocate another node in the tree, node in the hash table, and then put there a pointer to that recently malloced node. And then you plop this person's name. In this field there. So, how do we go about implementing a hash function that still returns an int, the index value in your hash table that you want to put this new person? But what in the world can we do when we're given a, a name as input, a char star? Yeah. Ah, so that's kind of a neat approach. So, we can get the first letter, so we can do this more succinctly, but to be clear, I'll do char c gets what, s bracket zero? Okay, can this code crash? So, yes, why? So, if it's null. So, here too are sort of design decisions. You know, normally we would preach something like if s equals equals null, what should we do instead? Return, I mean, it's a design decision, right? It's not clear. If you return zero, well, does that mean you're supposed to put this non existent name in the zeroth location? Probably not. If you return one, as we often do to signify error, well, that's the same idea. Do you want to put it in location one? Probably not. Maybe negative one, that's fine, because at least that signifies a sort of impossible location. But now, what do you have to be careful of? Right, now the caller, whoever invokes this hash function, needs to check what's returned so that he stupidly doesn't try to go himself beyond the index, the bounds of this array. So, and notice just this book took the convention of indexing from 1 on to 31. Same idea with uh, uh, 0 to 30. Okay, so what else? Let's take for granted that it's not going to be null. So we don't have to worry about that design decision. I now have the first character s,、uh, s bracket 0. What do I want to do with it in order to determine a location? Okay, so return,、uh, what about uppercase A? Say it again. Oh, good. So、um, it gets very loud if I do that. So if you、um, simply return, hash on like 26 now, or hash on the number 6, hash on size, you will get back a number. So we could do something like what? So int C, cast that to an int, and then do that mod 6. But what's the downside of that, to be clear? Is there one? So it's probably always going to be larger than six. Does that matter mathematically?
OK, so there's this question of waste, but when you do something mod 6, what range of values are you going to get back? So you're still going to get back 0 to 5. So it might not necessarily be bad. I mean, if you want to standardize, this might not be a bad thing. In fact, I might propose something like this along these same lines. Why don't we sort of standardize what format these characters are in so that little a and little and big A both end up in the same bucket, which might have some value, especially if this is a program taking user input and people are lazy, they don't capitalize the first letter of their first name. You don't necessarily want to think that a user is not in your database just because they happen to lazily type their name in all lowercase and therefore you overlook it. So having some sort of um, standardization is good. And this is going to be important while spell checking, certainly, because we're going to be passing you arbitrary English words from actual text, whether it's some Simpsons quote or the Bible itself. And so you're going to get a mixture of capital letters and lowercase letters. And you're not going to want to just say, no, this is not a word, just because it happened to be capitalized in the input text when it, in fact, is a, uh, a legitimate word. But sure, we could certainly do something now like if we wanted to standardize, if it simply keeps things cleaner in our minds. So let's subtract off the value of capital A. Now I'm going to get back a value between zero, at least starting at zero and 25, assuming the user hasn't put some punctuation at the beginning of their name. So again, there's some opportunities for error checking there. But then sure, at this point, we could return something like C mod um, size. And we don't need to do the casting. Remember, all that is implicit unless you want to be explicit for your own sanity as to what's going on. All right, so OK, we now have a hash function that, unless we've coded up some bugs, simply hashes on, so to speak, the first letter of the name being passed in. What is good about this design? What's good about this design? Yep. We know where things are. It's deterministic, right? And if the same name comes in, it's going to end up in the same location the next time around, even if the user has accidentally uppercased it or lowercased it, because we're going to deal with that, OK? That's good. What else is good about this? It's only four lines, right? Really didn't take that much time or mental energy to code up. And that alone can certainly be a compelling reason. Um, and simple, too. It's very easy to explain it. It's very obvious reading the code how this thing works. And that alone is a virtue, perhaps. All right, now a downside. Let's see if we can tear down what we just built up. What's bad about this? Yeah. So you might have, say again? Uh, so you can't have a size larger than 26 because you're only going to get back values maximally between 0 and, say, 25, assuming we're only dealing with alphabetical characters, which means we can bump up this thing, sure, to uh, size 20. Uh, six, and that's okay, right? That'll because we'll get back values now between zero and two uh, and twenty-five. But does this really help us now with this hash function? No, right? You're going to get all your clustering at the beginning of your array, presumably from zero to twenty-five. And even though you might think you might be spreading things out more evenly, your hash function is not allowing you to do that because it's only giving you a number um, in. Um, in that range because C itself will only be between 0 and 25. So 0 uh, or what any number in that range divided by a, a mod 100 is just going to give you back the value of C. So it's never actually going to, the modulo is not very useful in this case. What else is bad about this design, perhaps? Yeah? It doesn't really account for what about alphabetic characters? So it definitely doesn't handle non-alphabetical characters. So that's definitely a dangerous flaw, especially if we're not checking for that elsewhere. So that's bad. What else? Yeah. Yeah. So that might be the biggest kicker of all, right? There's probably not that many people with first names that start with Q as there are, say, people whose names start with D or C or one of the more popular you know, Wheel of Fortune type letters. So although, yeah. Too silly today. All right. <laughs> Not much sleep. Um, so that's certainly a damning aspect of this code because we're going to get clustering. We're going to get an uneven distribution over the width of this hash table. And so that's probably not sort of in our interest when the whole purpose of this data structure in the first place was to come up with something that's fairly optimal. In fact, can you infer from this picture now, from this textbook, what these people might have hashed on given the size of this array? So these are people. What did they hash on? It wasn't their names in this case, even though it's not obvious from the picture. But it suggests other options. 
birthday. So if you assume a uniform distribution of birthdays at least throughout a given month, you know that too. It's a number, might actually get the job done. But if we don't have birthdays, as we don't in this case, if we're only past a string, what might be slightly more clever? Right? Hashing on just the first letter seems to create problems whereby we're going to use. We're going to have really long chains for popular letters and really short chains for others, which is great when it comes to the people with less common names using our software, but in the whole, it's going to annoy the masses, right? We've not optimized the common case, so to speak. We've really optimized the uncommon case. Yeah. Okay, okay, so that's interesting. We could hash on the second letter. So it's sort of an easy and obvious next step. It's not all that hard to code. Again, beware actually going beyond someone's name if they've only typed in their first initial, perhaps. So there are some gotchas.、Um, good things, bad things about this before we try others? So you might only get a, so, right, so、uh, the dependency is perhaps the way to summarize it. So there's, even though that's probably better, there probably, if you look, or if you're a statistician and you look at the, Engli- the corpus of English words, odds are there probably will be some dependencies where certain letters are, cer-、uh, are simply more common as a second letter than others. But it might be better and it might be enough to get the job done. Other approaches? Yeah. Oh, interesting. So we can inject a little bit of statistics into it. If we have, say, a cheat sheet, maybe even that we found online, that says here is a ranking of the most popular letters that begin English speakers' names, we might say, you know what, let's take the top five or the top ten of these, and they're probably, I'm guessing, letters like C and D, sort of the more obviously popular ones. And let's just say, you know what, if the first letter happens to be one of those letters, so if, let's say,、uh, S bracket zero equals equals D. Then what we could do is actually hash on, let's say, S bracket one. So we can kind of merge these two ideas, right? So only do it for some letters, but maybe we can do even more than this. Can we pick on not just individual letters? Can we do something else altogether? It's not a bad idea. What else could we do, though, that doesn't require some pre knowledge, but at least feels a little better? Hash on a number of letters. So, why not just hash on the entire word? Right? So, there are ways to do this. We could do something like for i,、uh, int i gets zero, i, and let's say n equals the str length of s. Again, I'm assuming that this is not a null pointer. Let's do this as long as i is less than n. Then let's go ahead and do i. plus plus. Then I could do something like this. Let's say int tally gets zero. I could do something like tally. Plus equals whatever the current letter is at the ith location, so that at this point in the story, I actually have a big sum. You know, it might not be, it will vary based on the size of the word, certainly. So there is a linear running time implication here, but what can I then do with that sum? I could return something like tally mod size, and good? Bad? It's, it's unclear, right? Unless you actually go into sort of analysis of what the implications of this are, at least I would argue this is still pretty simple, but it also takes into account or at least blurs the problems that might come up if you're assuming that the first letter is good enough. So odds are we might get a better distribution, but the takeaway here is frankly, these are exactly the kinds of decisions that problem set six will have you. Answer for yourself, right? So it's not all that hard to make a change to your code, you'll find, recompile it, rerun our benchmark, because these things are only meant to take a few seconds each, and you'll see for yourself did this do better or worse. And granted, you'll be sort of optimizing your code to some extent for the given set of texts that we're giving you, the given dictionary and the given inputs, but they're meant to be somewhat representative of a real corpus of literature. And that's really what the problem set is about, is to get you to consider these various trade offs. All right, so what does this mean now for the various operations? How do you go about finding a person in a hash table? So you're given their name. What's the first step that you do? You hash the name, you get back an int called whatever, and you use that int to go into your hash table, which is really just a big array. And now you find yourself at the appropriate location in the array. What do you do next? Sorry? S- sorry? 
So there's a pointer there, and that pointer is either null or it's non null. If it's non null, that means you probably want to start up a for loop or a while loop and start walking along that chain. And each time you hit a different node in that structure, very similar to the code you'll see in list2.c, if you look at it more closely this weekend or next week, you can then do something like a str compare, so strcmp, the string comparison function, and check is the name here, is the name here, is the name here. What's less obvious, though, is when you do an insert, suppose you in,、uh, in try to Insert the word foo, a person with the name foo, and so you hash on f or on the sum of f o o or on something more sophisticated still, and you get back a number between 0 and 30 or 1 and 31. You go to that location and it's null. Well, that's easy. I sort of sketched the picture there. You instantiate with malloc a new node. You plop that person's name in there, probably by doing a str copy so that you keep around that memory, and then you insert him into wherever that null pointer was. But what if there's already a long chain of people, as in the case of Jay Bartlett and S. Chase and、uh, these other two folks at location 19? What do you do when you insert a person there? What are your options? Where can you put them? So, you can put them at the end, right? It's not hard to get to the end. Just do while pointer not equal to null, and that will take you all the way to the end. And so long as you've kept track of the previous hop, you found the last guy in the list, and you can drop him there. What's maybe simpler than that? Just put him in the beginning, because the running time of insert, if you put him in the beginning, is constant time to compute the function, at least de depending on your hash function, plus one more step. To do the insertion, essentially, because you just have to sort of make room for him. And that requires、uh, inserting him, updating one pointer. So, two operations, still constant time. Though I did try to qualify that. What's currently the running time of this hash function? So, it's kind of big O of what? Yeah, so we might say it's big O of k, where you'd have to specify you know, in the, the answer you're writing what k is, but it's not the size of the dictionary, which will probably, or, or the size of the input, which is probably n. It's not the size of the dictionary, which we could slap some other variable on, maybe m, but it's maybe big O of k, where k is a variable because it varies based on the word being looked up or the word being inserted, but at least it's pretty short, right? If it's an English word, odds are it's five characters, 10 characters, maybe 12, 13. Probably not many more than that. So it's not necessarily such a bad thing if it takes, say, 13 operations to hash on all of the letters if it gives you a much better distribution. So, any questions about hash tables? So, what more can we do? Well, a hash table is really just a fancier version of a linked list. If we now introduce the idea of trees, we get much more. Uh, expressiveness and a more sophisticated data structure, still one that we can actually use to compress data, as we'll see. But let's take a two minute break. All right. So, trees. Fortunately, these things are not all that conceptually new to us. They think of a tree in the computer science sense, in the data structure sense, sort of like a family tree, where you have some root element, so to speak, beneath which are a whole bunch of、uh, descendants or children, if they're immediate neighbors of them. So, this slide here is meant to just slap some typical jargon on them. Siblings are nodes that are on the same level in the tree and that have the same parent, and leaves are nodes that are simply at the very bottom of the tree. But the question for us now is who cares? What can you actually do with these things? Well, I conceptually think of each of these circles as a node in the tree. So it's not a node in a linked list, it's not a node in a hash table, it's now a node in a tree. But as these arrows suggest, you can implement this thing much like you did a linked list or a hash table. You've got a node that's got some piece of data, looks like an int in this particular example. And then what else does each node in this tree appear to have? Two pointers, right? A pointer called left, perhaps, and a pointer called right, each of which are of type node star. So it's pretty much a linked list, but whereby the lists can kind of go off in different directions. So it's not a huge leap from where we've been at. But there is something interesting about how these numbers have been drawn. This is an example of a BST, a binary search tree. So the binary in the, in the phrase simply means that every node has no more than two children. All right, and that's a useful thing to bear in mind. But it's a search tree in that there's a relationship among the numbers in this tree. And、uh, take the fifth on this question if you've seen these things before. But if you're looking at this structure for the first time, what pattern can you notice among the numbers and how they're laid out? Say again? Uh, multiples of 11, yes, coincidence though. <laughs> 
What, sorry? The one, what about the one to the left? Yes, so if you look at a given node like 55 at the top, the node to the left of it, its left child, is a smaller value, but its node to the right, its right child, is a larger value. And if you now apply that same test to each of the other nodes, it does in fact check out. So a binary search tree is a tree whose nodes have no more than two children each, but whose node is larger than its left child and smaller. Than its right child. And if you're allowed to have、uh, duplicate values, then you have to decide how to arrange them. But we'll assume for now no duplicates to keep it simple. So this it begs the question, consistent with our previous chats, of what's the running time of this structure's various operations? What's the running time of the find operation here? If, to be clear, as the picture is kind of hinting at, all you need to represent a binary search tree in memory is one pointer, a pointer to the so called root, just like you need just one to represent the first element in a linked list. So, assuming you have to start at the root, what's the running time of finding a number in this tree? Yeah, so it appears to be log n, right? Because if the tree, each node in the tree can have two children, and each of those can have two children, but there's n total nodes, having any kind of tree structure like this allows you a logarithmic relationship with the structure's height. So, as a sort of rule of thumb from here on out, know that any time you sort of have、uh, or put two things on one level and two more things on the next level, that's again this sort of exponential effect, which, if you look at it in terms of the end result here, is that the height is of logarithmic height. So, we have what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven nodes here. So, seven is.、Um, It's certainly the height of this tree is not linear. It's something less than that. And if we started drawing out bigger and bigger trees still, you would see that it's roughly log of n, where n is the total number of nodes in the tree. But someone be a little pickier. Pick on this value. Most of、uh, the folks who spoke up said that the running time of this thing is logarithmic for find. Is that true? It's obviously not. Is that true? No, that's right. Everyone is catching on so quickly, right? So, the only definitions we've laid out for this thing, the requirements are that left child is less than the parent and right child is greater than the parent, and each node has no more than two elements. Well, what about some sort of crazy case like this 55, 77, and be consistent, 88. All right, that's it. Is this a binary search tree? Does it violate either of those definitions? Every node has two or fewer children, and every node is, larger, is smaller than its right child and larger than its left child, which is a meaningless statement here because none of them have left children, but that doesn't make the overall structure any less consistent with that definition. But unfortunately, the running time of find now on this thing is what? It's big O of n. So,、uh, binary search trees, though you might mislead the reader or mislead the class by pointing out, wow, the height is logarithmic when laid out this way, that's not necessarily always the case. This is just a specific example of one. And so, in this case, a binary search tree can devolve if you're not clever into. Just a linked list, and it's not all that much more interesting. And so, if you're starting to sort of get intrigued by these kinds of discussions and these trade offs, Computer Science 124 at Harvard,、um, Data Structures, is a wonderful follow up to this course, either this coming spring or next spring,、um, in that it, it asks questions like, all right, how do you deal with this? And you'll come across trees called、uh, Uh, AVL trees and red black trees and 2 3 trees and other types of trees that actually refine the definitions of what it means to insert and what it means to delete nodes in such a way that anytime you do an insert into a tree, well, what happens is that in, if you have to insert something into this tree, say the number 99, a naive algorithm, where it's not a pejorative, just means it's a simple approach,、um, would say, all right, where does 99 belong? Well, it can't go here to the left because that's not where it belongs in a BST. So we try to go to the right, but there's already someone here. Can't go left here because it's 99, so we go down further. Still, someone here can't go here, so we're going to have to tack him on here. And so, what you'll find in more sophisticated structures than pure BSTs is that, you know what, you can actually spend a few more cycles upon insertion and do what, do you think? To sort of uh, uh, avoid this devolving into the linked list it quickly is becoming. 
So it's kind of now becoming like this. So you'll see in things like AVL trees, two, uh, two, three trees, and others, you just kind of rotate the tree and you sort of move things around in memory. Whereby, you know what? Does this guy really need to be the parent of this thing? Well, no. We could kind of just swing him down here and reattach him as the left child of 77. And so that hints at some of the massaging you can do of the data structure to kind of deal with or avoid this becoming really problematic down the road. And so we're not going to deal with that here, but that hints at what some of the options are. We today are going to use these things for a more real world application. But first, let's introduce a similarly named, if oddly named, uh, structure called a tri. So it's pronounced tri.、Uh, if you look it up on Wikipedia, you'll see that the etymology relates to the word retrieval. Which ironically is pronounced retrieval, but it's spelled retrieval. And so this is a try to make it similar、uh, in spirit to a tree, but different. So similar but different. So what is a try? This picture doesn't make it quite clear, but I did hint at it Monday, which is that a try is just a tree. Each of whose nodes is not just a singleton, not just a node storing a string or an int, but it itself is an array. An array generally of size 26, at least in the dictionary context that we'll be playing. So each node in a try is an array of size 26. Now, this, because this would be a nightmare to draw, because an array of size 26 means this thing would be ridiculously wide, realize that this picture has kind of glossed over some of these details. So where you see it sort of、uh, drifting off like here, well, those are arrays. They're just not showing you all of them. But the advantage of a try is pretty compelling. If each of your nodes is, in fact, an array, it means each of your nodes has as many as 26 children. Now, contrast this with a tree, a binary search tree, that doesn't really lend itself to nice application with English words, because you certainly have, need more than two children if you want to sort of keep things sorted in an interesting way.、Right? So, actually, to be clear, the problem with something like a binary search tree, or a possible problem, is that you don't have much flexibility. And the tree can still grow pretty, pretty tall, even though you might want to cram more nodes into a given row just to save time. So, what a try does is this the root node is itself just an array of size 26, let's say, assuming no punctuation in any of our words. Now, each of those elements in the array is just a pointer, but it's a pointer to what? What does this seem to suggest each of those things is? It's actually, even though it looks like the character saying it's just a char, there's also an arrow there. So, what this is really saying is that each element in a tries node is a pointer to another node, otherwise, in this case, known as an array. So, the fact that this、um, example has written m here and p here and t here, this just means this is location 13. And so forth. So, you've hashed on, it seems, the first letter in the word being inserted. So, in other words, if you have the word, let's see if there's a short one in question here.、Uh, Mino is, okay, I think these were drawn from names, but I think the first one, one that was inserted, is Mino. All right, M E A N O. So, what's happened here is that the code has hashed on S bracket zero. It's found that it's an M, and so it goes to the mth location, so the 13th or 0 index 12th location in the root node, in its array. It finds there a pointer, and so it follows that pointer to a new array, this guy over here, and so he, it then hashes on the letter. Oh, actually, that's not even a word. You should have stopped me. I was making up words like this, which is now it makes sense as to why it doesn't make sense. Maxwell is a much more reasonable sounding name. All right, so Maxwell, whoops. Maxwell. All right, so Maxwell. So you hash on the first letter, which is an M. That leads you to this array here. You then hash on S bracket 1, which is the second letter. That then leads you to this thing. And again, it's sort of、um, blurred so that it can actually fit on the screen. You then hash on X, which is toward the end of the alphabet. So you then follow that pointer. Follow, 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 follow until somehow you demark the end of a word. And in this particular example, the authors have said, you know what, we need some kind of sentinel value. Maybe it's null, maybe it's this just delta symbol, something that demarks the end of the word. So that we know the word in fact ends there. This is particularly important in what kinds of cases to know where words actually end.、Uh, so if you have, yeah, so if you actually have two names that actually have a common prefix. So in this case here, we have、uh, this guy here. 
who has a common prefix of MA, but this one here has a common, oh, that's, huh, strike two. Um, oh, here we go. This is the one you were talking about. So this guy here has a name that ends at this point, but there's someone else whose name actually continues to be longer. And we can sort of simplify this. If someone actually had a last name of Max, as well as another person with a last name of Maxwell, well, one is a prefix of the other. So if that had been the case, we would somehow have to have remembered somewhere around here that, you know what, yeah, there is a pointer to another array that sort of continues on for this longer name, but this is also a stopping point. And so even though I've sort of simplified things verbally and said that a tries nodes are really just arrays, there's actually got to be a little more metadata going on here. So a node in a try isn't just an array, it's probably a node, some kind of wrapper that has, yes, an array in it of size 26 or whatever, if you want to account for punctuation, but there's also probably some metadata. Maybe a Boolean flag, for instance, that just says yes or no, a word stops here. That's sort of an interesting uh, implementation detail that would come up in the design of this structure. But the interesting question for us here is, what's the running time of a try? The whole purpose of this try is to store, say, a dictionary of words. In this case, people's last names. In your case, 150,000 words. What's compelling about a try? What's the lookup time? Yeah? Yeah, so big O of the word length, which I'll again abstract away as big O of K, which might as well be a constant, right? Because if effectively your English words are all bounded by some reasonable value like 12, 12 is a constant, well, that means the words you're inserting only require constant time to insert and then later constant time to look up, one operation per letter in the word. Contrast this now with what seemed to be a moment ago a pretty fancy data structure. But what was the running time of find or insert in this structure? So this was, we said on um, Monday, so big O of, big O of N over M, where N is the number of words that are inserted, and M was what? The size of the array, in this case 31. So that's a bit of a misleading statement, right? Because if your array is a fixed size, it might as well just be N over 31. And we know that for our discussions of um, big O, you really just get rid of the constant. So theoretically, a hash table is still just big O of N, which means it's theoretically no better than a linked list. But clearly in the real world, this has got to be better than a linked list because each of those chains is one mth the size that they might be if you just had one huge linked list. So again, we've begun talking now not only about theoretical implications of your design decisions, but also of the real world implications. So it'll be an interesting question for you to answer for yourself. Do you go with a try, which seems to theoretically have a much more compelling running time because it's completely independent of the number of words actually in the dictionary? Or do you go with a hash table, which uh, has its own upsides among them? Even though this picture doesn't make it clear, what is the cost of getting this better theoretical running time in a try? So if you're murmuring memory, like that's one of the biggest answers. Even though the authors have taken some liberties and not shown you the size of the arrays, if every node in this tree is at least 26 bytes wide, that's a ridiculous amount of memory, especially memory that you're wasting because there's not many words that have a sequence of Qs together, for instance. So you're not going to be using Q all that often, not going to be using X probably all that often, except maybe somewhere in the middle of the word here, like in Maxwell. So you're wasting space in order to gain constant time access access, random access, but again, it's going to be a trade-off. So what can we do with these structures in the real world and as it relates to some past experiences? Well, we'll consider two examples, improving on sorting and also compressing actual data, much like a zip utility would on your own PC or Mac. So here's a quick definition to actually apply a notion of a tree, a binary tree, to some uh, familiar application. Um, a tree can be called a heap if it satisfies two properties. It's complete. Now what do we mean by that? That means if you draw the tree from top to bottom, left to right, every possible location for a node is filled in except for maybe the bottom right of the tree. So that means if you have like a pile of nodes in your hand and you need to sort of draw them on paper, you start at the top, then you go left child, right child, then you go left child, right child, left child, right child, and so forth. You do them top to bottom, left to right, and so long as you do that, your binary tree that you've just drawn on paper is quote unquote complete. The only holes are at the bottom of the page. Now it satisfies what's called the heap order property if each node's value is greater than or equal to that 
of its children. In other words, the bigger nodes in a heap are toward the top. And it's a guarantee that each node will be bigger than or at least equal to its two children. But there's no distinction made anymore between left child and right child. So a heap is a binary tree, but not a binary search tree, because the search tree did say something about left versus right. So that's it. So quick sanity check、uh, from left to right with these three trees, which of these are heaps on the screen? Is the left one a heap? Okay, so yes, the left one is a heap because it satisfies both properties. It's complete because the only missing spot is down here, but that's fine. It's the bottom right. And every node is bigger than, in this case, its two children. So that's good. What about the one next to it? Yes? No? No. So it's, miss it's got a hole here. That violates the complete property. So that's not, in fact, a heap. What about the last one? No, because you have this transposition of at least six and eight, so the parent is not, in fact, bigger than its children. So, quick sanity check only one of those is, in fact, a heap. Now, who cares? What can we do with this? Well, first, let's define a silly sounding word. To heapify a tree is to do the following it's to take something that is an almost heap, that is, it's sort of structured like, the heap, like a heap in that it is complete. But it doesn't yet satisfy the heap order property, that thing about magnitude of nodes' values. So, what is the problem with the almost heap on the left? There's a problem with the left hand complete binary tree. It's almost a heap, but it's not quite a heap because what's wrong on the left hand side? Yeah, so these guys are swapped, right? Nine's got to be on top of two. So we'll define heapification. To heapify an almost heap is to look at a branch in the tree that's got some anomaly and then fix it along that branch. And take a guess what is sort of the basic operation that we're going to use to fix an almost heap? Swap. Right? So it's a little fancier, this swap, than just swapping two integers, r i g h because t you actually have to deal with some pointers and make sure you're updating the child pointers and the parents' pointers and so forth. But it's still a constant number of operations. You just have to move a few arrows, a few pointers around. And so heapifying an almost heap means to go from left picture to right picture, where in fact in the second picture, the heap, has, the heap property has been fixed. And that's the only place it was violated. All right, so now let's put this to use. So, this is kind of a big looking picture, but it's just showing us something step by step by step. Essentially, if you want to heapify a whole tree, not just a branch, what you do conceptually is you go all the way to the bottom right corner of the tree, and then you work your way on the lowest level from right to left. Then you go up one level and work from right to left. Then from up one level from right to left. So in, in, you do the opposite order in which the tree was probably created. And what you do is heapify each of the trees. That begin with that node in question as its own root. So, a tree, notice, is this very recursively defined structure. A tree is just a tree of trees because the left child, yes, it's a node, but if it has things dangling off of it, that's a tree. Same deal for the right child. So, because there's this recursive definition to a tree, we can consider one big tree to be just the combination of a bunch of little trees. And that's what this picture is hinting at. So, to heapify something like、uh, the number six, Involves nothing. It's already heapified. It's a complete binary tree and that satisfies the heap order property because there's nothing going on there. Same deal here. What does it take to heapify this thing? Nothing. This thing? Nothing. This thing? Nothing. Because they're leaves, so to speak. It's when you finally get to some of the inner nodes, like this thing, that we have to heapify an almost heap. So it's an almost heap again, to be clear, because it's complete. But it doesn't necessarily satisfy the heap order property. So here's a problem. The number two, which is the root of this subtree, is obviously smaller than its two children. So to fix this, we need to make sure that the parent, the current root, is bigger than the children. But there's a discretion you have here. You can either say, oh, wait a minute, the problem is that six is bigger than two. Let me swap those. But what's that going to create? Sort of not much forward progress because now seven is still below six, so you're going to have to do another swap. But there's an easier fix if you inject a little intelligence into the first decision. Which guy should you swap up first? Well, the biggest of the children. So do the two comparisons first, pull up seven, and so the end result is that now we've heapified this almost heap. So now I'm going to go up one level and consider the tree all the way on the right, and so we get this. Set of nodes here. This too is an almost heap, but not quite, because we have to swap eight out with either its left or right child. Do a quick comparison. It's obvious that nine's got to come up. And so this subtree 
as heapified becomes this. Now we move slightly to the left. And now our tree is getting a little more interesting, but it is still complete. Even though it looks a little strange, does this thing need to be heapified? Yeah, so it looks like, let's see, 7 is below 5 and 6 is also below 5. So we've got some problems there. So if we fix those, what we ultimately get is this picture here, where we've sort of bubbled 7 up and we've bubbled 6 down. So, or rather, we've bubbled 5 down. So we've sort of moved 5 down, down, down until he ends up some better place. Then finally, we consider the whole tree. It's still an almost heap. So we have this thing here. What's out of order here? Well, looking at the root, number one, we have to do what? So we have to swap 9 with 1. So we fix this branch here, choosing the larger child so that we don't create yet more work for ourselves. So now at this point in the story verbally, 1 is here, 9 is at the top. We've not created a problem now anywhere over here because we already chose the larger problem to deal with. So now we have 1 on top of 8 and 3. Well, here too we have to heapify. And so we bubble uh, uh, 1 down further, swapping 8 on top of it. So you can now see sort of the pattern. The bigger the tree gets, you can see that on each iteration, we've started with the root. We've said, all right, is this root bigger than its two children? If not, we've got a problem. Let's fix it. Find the larger of the two children and go ahead then and swap that parent with that child. But then you repeat this process wherever, you, uh, wherever that child was. And so you have this effect potentially of bubbling really small values from the roots on down potentially as far as the leaves. So the question at hand then is how long does it take to heapify a whole tree like this? Well, on each iteration maximally, how many swaps are you doing? How far is it from root to leaf? Which is in fact the worst case as it was in the case of number one. So it's log n, right? So these are binary trees that are also complete, which is good because you don't get that stringy sort of linked list type thing going on. They're complete because they're nice and packed, sort of all the way up and all the way to the left with holes only in the bottom row. So that's good because it means the height of a heap is by design, the height of a complete binary tree is by design log n. So that means maximally each iteration is going to bubble an element down no more than log n steps. Now how many nodes are there in the tree in the first place? n total. Now even though this is an overestimate because it really didn't take that much effort to fix the leaf nodes, so there really wasn't much involved at all there, what this seems to suggest is that heapifying a complete binary tree, no matter what's in there in the beginning, such as this arbitrary case, only takes log n times n steps or n log n. So we can actually leverage this. What if we do the following? Suppose I wanted to sort n elements, and I also wanted to do it in place. So one of the downsides of merge sort was what? Even though we didn't actually code it up. What do you need for merge sort to work? So more memory, more space. You need essentially a duplicate array that you can plop the numbers in as you're merging things together. And that was the cost of merge sort, but it was kind of acceptable, at least it's in our discussions, because we finally chipped away at what were otherwise quadratic running times, n squared. Well, heap sort is finally giving us another option that doesn't require that much more memory, other than some potential pointers, and even those we can get rid of. So here's a tree that is consistent now with this list of numbers. So the question here is, here's a list of numbers, 35, 15, 77, 60, 22, and 41. Sort them for me. Well, what you can do with heap sort is you can, as I was hinting at verbally before, take these numbers as though they're like a bag of chips and place them down on a piece of paper forming a complete binary tree, irrespective of what values are on those chips. But then you can go about heapifying the tree. And by heapifying the tree, can you proceed to sort this actual thing? So what do we mean by that? Well, here's the arbitrary but nonetheless complete binary tree that results in just taking these numbers as given, 35, then 15, 77, 60, 22, 41. Just plop them into place, into this tree, making sure it's complete. Then we heapify. And the story is the same as we told a moment ago. So we'll just sort of wave our hands at that detail. And we just said that that process takes n log n steps. So that's good, because we're already within the boundaries of merge sort. We've certainly not done any worse, it would seem, asymptotically. So how do we now sort these things? Well, here at this point in the story, we have a true heap. It's complete, and it satisfies that heap order property. Why is this interesting with respect to sorting? 
even though there's no constraints on left child versus right child, what is a conclusion you can draw about a heap based on its definition? What's that? Yeah. The implication of the parent always being bigger than the children, if you apply that again and again and again, that means that the biggest element is the so called root. So it's no coincidence that the number 60, the largest in the elements I was given, is in fact at the root. Again, there's no implication between left child and right child. But who cares? Because much like selection sort, where I just cared about finding the smallest element, well, with heap sort, I'll just care about finding. The biggest element, and I will plop that into place first. So, what I can do here essentially is the following. If this is my tree in this step in the story, you know what I'm going to do? I need to sort of pull 60 out of rotation, much like we did with selection sort. I need to pull him out of place and put him in some arbitrary but some consistent location like the beginning of the list. Well, you know what I'm going to do with heap sort? I'm going to pull that number out. I'm going to rip the root out and put him at the end of the tree, the end of the list. So to do that, I'm going to swap 60 with 22. So the end of my list is going to be the end of this tree. And so what's happened here is sort of this picture. So we've gone from here to here. Whereby the only change made was between 22 and 60 being swapped. But now, what I'm going to do mentally in my algorithm is just say, you know what? Conceptually, this thing is no longer part of the tree. Just leave it alone. It's already been sorted. And conceptually, what this means is that we've put it aside off to the side of the list. Oh, and you know what? I did skip. Oh, I skipped a step here. I, I apologize. Um, <laughs> same story. 77 was the biggest. Swap it with the smallest element, with, with, with the bottom most rightmost element, which was 35. Apologies. This guy gets swapped first so that he ends up here. Now that screwed up the root, to be sure. 35 is in the wrong location, but 77 is now at the end of the tree, so we can sort of eliminate him conceptually from consideration. And so the question to ask, which is the same question in the bottom of the picture, just different numbers, is how do we fix the problem we just created? So I've ripped out the biggest element, which was 77. I've plopped him at the end and sort of ignoring him from here on out. But now I've put a smaller element, 35, at the root of the element. How do I fix this? Well, the only bug in the tree right now is that the top element, 35, is now smaller than its children. But I've only touched one element. I haven't screwed up the rest of the tree, just the root. So let me see if I can fix that. 35's children at the moment are 60 and 41. Obviously, who should I swap 35 with? 60. So 35 bubbles down, and I'm sorry for missing my own arrow, bubbles down one step here. Now I need to do a sanity check. Is 35 now bigger than his two children, 12 and 22? Yes. So I'm done with that. But maximally, just to play devil's advocate, how many steps maximally might, have I, might I have um, had to bubble 35 down in the tree? Log n. So fixing an element, worst case, might take as many as log n steps. So now sort of take this leap. Now I fixed my tree. So what's at the root of the new tree? Well, 60. And that's great, because 60 is the biggest element in the tree. And that means I can now swap him. Now we can pick off the story where I left off with 22. Now I can remove 60 from consideration, but really what's happening is I have 60 and I have 77 at the end of the tree, and that's good because I know where they are. But now I've screwed the tree up again. I've plopped 22 in the root of the tree, but again, how many steps maximally does it take to fix that? Log n. So in other words, to set the tree up in the first place, to take an arbitrary set of numbers, plop them into a complete tree, heapify it, we said in the beginning, took n log n. But we haven't even done anything interesting yet, so n log n. Thereafter, I have to pull out every large element from biggest to smallest again and again, and that takes n steps because there's n elements in the tree. And every time I do that, I screw the tree up. But fixing the tree takes only how many steps? Log n. So it's as though it takes me some startup time, n log n, to get things in order, then another n log n. To sort of clean up my mess on each iteration, but that means the running time of heap sort is just two times n log n, which asymptotically in big O is just n log n. So, yes, you know, we're kind of hiding a detail, like actually it takes twice as long as that number suggests, but it doesn't use any additional memory. And in fact, even though we've been a bit fancy here and saying, you know what, you need to update the pointer and the left child and the right child, it turns out that you can represent a complete binary tree. As an array. 
And this is where the sort of really neat trick comes in, in that is even though conceptually it's great to sort of think of things as this, you don't need to be that complicated. It's no coincidence that this example is actually listing these numbers as though they are just an array of sequential numbers. In fact, take a look at this number, uh, the original tree here. What I argue is that you can just leave that list of numbers in the form you were given it, assuming the form was an array. So here's my array of numbers. This is index location 0, 1, 2, dot, dot, dot. And now I argue that you can actually traverse, quote, unquote, this tree. You can go from parent to left child and parent to right child using a very simple mathematical formula. The left child is going to simply be uh, 2, and I no, the tablet is not ideal for this. 2i plus 1. And the index location of the right child, r, is just going to be 2i plus, take a guess, 2. Does this check out? Well, let's see. If 35, as represented in memory as just a simple array, is at location 0, well, who is his left child? If I'm only, I guess you can't see that if I cover up the left-hand side. If you cover up the left-hand side of that tree and only look at the array, 35 is at index location 0. So the left child is 2 times i. 2 times 0 plus 1 is 1. And indeed, the number 15 is at location 1, and that checks out because he's his left child. Meanwhile, number 2. So 2 times 0 is 0 plus 2 gives me the number 2. That's 77. And you know what? That checks out here, too. Let's do one more sanity check. What about 15? 15 is 0, 1. So that's location 1. So 2 times 1 is 2 plus 1 is 3. So that's 0, 1, 2, 3. 60. Where is 60? Aha, left child. Plus 2, right child. And so you have this kind of neat example here where it actually helps, I think, to think about the algorithms and the design of the problem in terms of a higher level data structure like a tree. But that doesn't mean you have to jump through hoops and whip out malloc and pointers and all of this to actually implement the thing. If you take a step back and think, what else can I exploit about this definition? The heap order property is great because it always plops the biggest element at the top. But the complete property means I don't need the overhead of a tree even though it's nice to think about it that way, I can implement it in a much slicker fashion with just the age-old array that we've used for weeks. We'll come back to compression on Monday. See you then.